Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Last week we took a pretty close look at the predictions for global temperature increases and the reasons for concern outlined in the first three chapters of a landmark IPCC special report published on the 8th of October 2018. As well as providing a pretty stark assessment of the latest climate science research, the report also finishes with two chapters looking at possible mitigation and adaptation strategies. These two chapters are called Strengthening and Implementing the Global Response and Sustainable Development, Poverty Eradication and Reducing Inequalities. You know, not small subjects, more like a proposed blueprint of how the entire planet's geopolitical and technological infrastructure will have to operate in the next 80 years to ensure the survival of the human species as well as minimising the number of other animal species we eradicate as we trample clumsily through the rest of this century. From the 3rd to the 14th of December this year in Katowice in Poland, world politicians and international lawyers will congregate at the Conference of Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, otherwise known as COP24. That's six weeks from today, so this channel will be dedicating the next six weeks to looking at all the proposals and initiatives outlined in chapters four and five of the report so that folks like you and me can check whether our illustrious leaders get anywhere close to achieving what will need to be really unprecedented and historic agreements in December. Now I know from your feedback and comments over the six months that this channel has been operating that many of you out there feel that our politicians and leaders have let us down so badly and that the climatological feedback loops and tipping points are accelerating so quickly in so many areas of the planet that there's really no way back for our climate system now, regardless of what our politicians achieve in Poland. And I'll be honest, I've got some sympathy for that point of view, but I make my living running projects that build things, so I'm kind of hardwired to look for solutions, however impossible they seem. So with that in mind, my first task here is to set out for you exactly what it says in chapters four and five of the IPCC report. The report breaks down strengthening and implementing the global response into these five categories, and each of those have got multiple subcategories. Then, and crucially in my opinion, the final chapter of the report considers sustainable development, poverty eradication, and reducing inequalities by focusing on these sectors. It's an awful lot to take in and pretty much impossible to tackle in one go, which is why I'm definitely not gonna try. But we'll take a look at a couple of headings a week as we run up to COP24 and hopefully build up a picture of what the IPCC are going to be recommending that our politicians discuss and resolve when they get together for their big powwow in December. So let's take the first two headings, accelerating the global response to climate change and pathways for minimising temperature increases. The report reminds us that we live in an increasingly interconnected world with the human population growing from the current 7.6 billion to over 9 billion by mid-century. Global economic output, wealth and trade all continue to grow rapidly and it's true to say that there has also been an overall reduction in extreme poverty. But, and this is a big but, this rapid growth has also brought rising inequality, exclusion and social stratification in most countries around the world and that inequality is fueling social and political tensions. The common thread running through the entire report is the IPCC's central tenet that the human species needs to do everything in its power to keep the planet from warming more than 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. But frankly, whether we shoot for this or the slightly less delusional two degrees Celsius increase, there are still gonna be massive social, economic, and political challenges. The report points out that whatever the potential long-term benefits of minimizing the global temperature rise, these unprecedented measures may suffer from a lack of broad political and public support, especially if they worsen existing short-term economic and social tensions, including unemployment, poverty, inequality, financial tensions, competitiveness issues, and what the report refers to as the loss of economic value of carbon intensive assets, with the further statement that the challenge is therefore how to strengthen climate policies without inducing economic collapse or hardship and to make them contribute to reducing some of the fault lines in the world economy. So here's my take on those statements. I think what the IPCC are somewhat euphemistically trying to suggest is that if by some miracle the politicians actually find 
enough collective backbone to stand up to the fossil fuel money and implement policies including punitive carbon taxation and tariffs that make fossil fuel extraction untenable in the very near future, then we'll also need to make sure that as the fossil fuel companies go down, they don't take the rest of us down with them. And that means globally agreed policies that allow renewable energy and storage technologies and smart distributed energy grids to be developed without punitive taxes or tariffs across borders. It also means massive government assisted retraining programs for normal hardworking people who find themselves displaced from their previously stable careers as a result of the seismic technological changes like the move from carbon fuels to renewable energy. It's something that many previous administrations all over the world have neglected to do for other industries like coal and steel in the past and it can lead to loss of income, loss of dignity and loss of purpose in life. So there's the first huge challenge for our politicians. In fact, I feel the need to start a new board with a to-do list for our leaders to take into their Polish negotiations. And there's a second priority to go on the list straight away, eradicating corruption from global technological and economic systems. Here's how the IPCC report eloquently refers to it. As the transitions require accelerated and coordinated action in multiple systems across all world regions, they are inherently exposed to the risks of free riding and moral hazards. Corruption. A key governance challenge is how the convergence of voluntary domestic policies can be organized via aligned global national and subnational governance based on reciprocity and partnership and how different actors and processes in climate governance can reinforce each other to enable this. The emergence of polycentric sources of climate action and transnational and subnational networks that link these efforts offer the opportunity to experiment and learn from different approaches, thereby accelerating approaches led by national governments. Yeah, in other words, governments sit down, talk to each other, identify the root causes of corruption, apply legislation to stamp it out, and then enforce that legislation ruthlessly. Now, we've got some fancy tables, graphs and charts coming up in a minute. You know me, I do like a chart. So in order for us to know what they're on about, we first of all need to look at some of the IPCC's abbreviations, because like every other organisation in the world, they do love their TLAs, which is three letter acronyms. So let's start with SSPs. These are shared socio-economic pathways. The IPCC developed these to complement the RCPs, which are the representative concentration pathways. We looked at RCP 8.5 in the last programme, which was fairly terrifying. Now there are five SSPs. SSP 1 is a sustainable development pathway, which is kind of their best case scenario. SSP 2 is called middle of the road development, which is kind of their middle of the road pathway. SSP3 is called Regional Rivalry, where potential conflicts are factored in. SSP4 deals with inequality. And SSP5 is called Fossil Fuel Development Pathway, which as you can imagine, is the worst case scenario. These SSPs have been used by the IPCC for quite a long time. But for this latest report, a new set of scenarios has been developed based on the latest data and research. These are called Archetypal Pathway Scenarios. Scenario 1, or S1, is defined as a sustainability-oriented scenario. Scenario 2, or S2, much like SSP2, is defined as a middle-of-the-road scenario. Then, for reasons best known to the IPCC, they didn't bother with S3 or S4, but went straight to S5, which is defined as a fossil fuel intensive and high energy demand scenario. In other words, worst case again. Then just to really add to the confusion, they include something called the LED scenario, which is a low energy demand scenario reflecting more recent literature with a stronger focus on demand side measures, which is the consumer side of the equation. You and me, in other words. The final abbreviation you need to know is IAM. This stands for Integrated Assessment Modeling, which the IPCC define as integrating knowledge from two or more domains into a single framework which is aimed at providing a more holistic and rounded future scenario modelling tool. Which seems fair enough. These IAMs are actually one of the main tools used right throughout the report. So with these acronyms in mind, here's a table showing a range of required changes in the four main energy consumption sectors based on the four archetypal pathway scenarios. And if you're following at home, Table 4.1, Chapter 4, Page 12. 
starting with global energy use, which is essentially populations and their energy needs, to hit the LED target by 2030, we need renewables to make up 37% of primary energy use and 60% of electricity use. By 2050, the renewables contribution would need to have risen to 73% in primary energy and 77% in electricity generation. Then comes the energy demand for buildings. Scenarios 1 and 2 actually accept a small rise in building energy use, but if we're shooting for the low energy demand scenario, then we're looking for a 30% reduction in building energy demand by 2030 and a 45% reduction by 2050. And that's no mean task. Transport comes next. For the LED scenario, we need 21% of our vehicles to be electric by 2030, rising to nearly 60% by 2050. And the final column looks at emissions reductions in industry. This one is really pretty stark. To achieve the low energy demand scenario here would require a 42% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030 and a 91% reduction by 2050. Now, the eagle-eyed among you will no doubt have spotted that this table doesn't include a column for reduction of land use change, which of course is one of the biggest contributors to CO2 emissions, as well as other nasties like methane and nitrous oxide. It's not clear why they didn't include it here, but they certainly reference it later on and we'll be taking a good look at their conclusions in a later video. Nevertheless, the changes in this table are massive and they're also extremely disruptive and they'll be very expensive to implement. In fact, based on the Integrated Assessment Modelling or IAM literature that the IPCC have assessed, they arrive at this statement. Climate policies in line with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius would require a marked upscaling in supply-side energy system investments between now and mid-century, reaching levels of between 1.6 and 3.8 trillion US dollars per year globally, with an average of about 3.5 trillion US dollars per year over the period between 2016 and 2050. This can be compared to an average of about 3 trillion US dollars per year over the same period for two degrees Celsius consistent pathways. The same integrated assessment modeling literature projects that investments in low emission energy will overtake fossil fuel investments globally by 2025 in a pathway that keeps us to 1.5 degrees of warming. And here's the projected investment numbers. Solar power, 1 trillion US dollars per year. Wind, 350 billion US dollars per year. Nuclear, $250 billion per year and hopefully gone as soon as humanly possible. Transmission, distribution and storage could be up to 1.3 trillion US dollars per year. By contrast, investments in fossil fuel extraction and fossil electricity generation need to fall by 850 billion US dollars a year between 2016 and 2050, with investments in coal generation projected to halt altogether by 2030 in this 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway. So how do the IPCC see as achieving that lot? Well, here's what the report says. 1.5 degrees Celsius consistent pathways would require robust, stringent and urgent transformative policy interventions targeting the decarbonisation of energy supply, electrification, fuel switching, energy efficiency, land use change and lifestyles. We're essentially in an emergency, not dissimilar to the one we faced in the Second World War, where industries were transformed forever within a couple of years to respond to what was obviously a clear and present danger. And that means we need global government intervention to make the necessary measures mandatory instead of voluntary. The Paris Agreement in 2015 was a good step forward, but it showed us that allowing nations to decide unilaterally on their level of commitment to contributions doesn't work. The sum total of all the commitments from all the nations as part of the Paris Agreement was not enough to keep us below 2 degrees Celsius of warming, let alone 1.5 degrees, and of course most of those nations are not living up to those commitments anyway. So right now, 3 degrees of warming or more by 2100 is the most likely outcome of our current national commitments. So that's going to need to be the final to do for this week's section. Next week we'll look at the global systems that need to change and the new systems that will need to be implemented to help us safeguard our future. That's it for now though. Please do subscribe and hit the notification bell to get alerted when a new program comes out and you can do that by clicking here. As always, 
Thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.